Welcome to the Big Calm Podcast. I'm Tara Palmer, the founder of Big Calm. I'm a marriage and family therapist with over 15 years in private practice and a lot of experience helping a variety of people with emotional and relational challenges. While that experience is important and helpful in shaping the ideas we'll talk about here on the show, it is my work of learning to mindfully operate my own nervous system that will make your time listening to me and the Big Calm team relatable. Whether you find yourself stuck in the same old frustrating patterns, unable to keep your calm, or just wishing certain parts of your life could be better, we've got some great stuff for you. Each episode contains good everyday nervous system informed material that can make all the difference. Thanks for being here with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Big Calm Podcast. I am your co-host, Scott Palmer, and I'm here with Tara Palmer. Excited to have you join us this week. Um, We're going to be talking about this notion of having an inner circle, and it's uh, very much a direct connection from this idea that we discussed last podcast regarding contagious energy and this idea that we can either um, activate or help regulate um, within our inner circle and between spouses and friends and other types of important relationships. So we wanted to build on that idea with this really important concept of uh, the inner circle or uh, as Tara sometimes refers to them, seat holders and choosing our seat holders um, wisely. So uh, let me open it up and just by asking Tara, what what is uh, an inner circle or this notion of seat holders and yeah, why so is it I'm important? I'm just going to back us up a little bit and do a little bit of a recap from our last episode um, for people who maybe didn't have an opportunity to tune in or listen through the whole thing. Um, and so... Uh, the idea of an inner circle will be re- more relevant when we're aware that um, a part of what goes on in our nervous system is this experience where our nervous system is always reading for um, what's happening outside of us in our environment, inside of us, our physiology, and then in the relationships experiences that we're having. So in the spaces between us and other people um, and a part of what our nervous system is reading um, is cues of safety and cues of danger um, in order to optimize our state to kind of support the different needs that might show up in a given situation. Um, so um, uh, part of what we also discussed last time was this idea that we um, in the context of that nervous system reading in the spaces in between, um, we are going to be, our nervous systems are going to be picking up, my nervous system picking up on, for example, Scott, in our interaction today, it'll be picking up on the cues occurring um, uh, in your nervous system. And so, and your nervous system, the same with mine. And so will my nervous system be picking up on activating type or activated type energies in your system and then maybe kind of like, ooh, what's going on here type of a, an assessment of what's happening or will it be picking up on like, oh, Scott's voice is so soothing and this is nice to be here with him today. And so having that more relaxed kind of co-regulating energy um, and so that, that contagious piece that we are doing a lot of talking about um, is at play all the time in all of our relational engagements. Um, so that said, um, as we're getting into today, talking about this idea that there's power in having an inner circle, um, uh, we want to just be aware that that's largely, um, kind of what's going to inform the conversation is that, um, when we can build in our lives, um, kind of an inner circle of people who are, capable maybe of kind of bringing a regulated enough nervous system to the relationship um, that we're really accessing this quality of connection with people that frankly just isn't available if we're in a relationship where both nervous systems are in more protective energies because we need to be in a physiological state to support um, more intimate forms of connection. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you. 
That makes sense. And um, one of the things that the this idea of an inner circle speaks to is that mm-hmm. there is a larger circle. If there's an inner circle, there must be a, a bigger circle out there, right? So um, can you maybe differentiate between sort of a an inner circle and like a, whatever that larger circle is? Yeah, I mean, I think so is. many people have kind of a broader social world that they exist in. And so, you know, for some people that's um, being actively involved with their their kids' schools, the their kids' sport activities, um, maybe their local church. Um, they might be in a volunteer community. They've got career connections. Um, and so there's just so many different places that we find ourselves socializing in the world and that those acquaintance, uh, those connections rather can be more acquaintance-type connections. Um, they might even go to a next level of knowing where we know some things about the people that we're interacting with. Um, but are the relationships like deeply supportive where we would feel comfortable going to connect for like deeper support needs or sharing more vulnerable parts of our life that are um, going on. And so part of what we're talking about when we're talking about the inner circle is creating um, maybe a smaller group of people that we're going to be connecting with on that level. Okay, that makes sense. So we'll maybe talk in a moment about what um, that smaller group, what kind of characteristics we're looking for. But um, one of the things that I wanted to address, I've heard uh, a phrase, something like um, always around people, but feeling alone or, or something like like that. Do you encounter a lot of that in your therapeutic practice where where people maybe have lots of, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 friends and uh, or acquaintances, if you will, but they still don't feel seen or heard or like anyone really truly knows yeah, them or vice versa back into that um, space that I was referencing in terms of if we're bouncing between a lot of these different circles, um, we might have people who, you know, genuinely like we've got warm connections with them. We care about them. They care about us, but that deeper knowing um, that takes frankly, just kind of like time <laughs> and um, a certain quality of experience of being with another person in order to build that type of knowing that you're talking about about um, isn't happening. And so, I, you know, to what degree can I be sitting at my son's baseball game chatting with, uh, you know, another um, team member's parent, and we might, you know, even be chatting about some things going on in our work environments or things going on with our kids, but are we um, dropping into, you know, maybe some deeper patterns of knowing with each other Um I'm not saying never, but maybe not the norm for that to be taking place in that kind of a context. Um, Am I building that kind of connection, you know, in passing with a colleague at work after a meeting? You know, again, probably not. So, um, So having that accessibility of the quality of connection that we're talking about, um, is going to be impacted by the environment and um, the amount of maybe time spent, the level of engagement available. Sure, that yeah, that makes sense. So I um, there's this notion of like pseudo intimacy, and I'm wondering if that applies here because I um, I hear sometimes people talking about having relationships, or they might know a lot of things about people, like oh, their hobbies are this or they're married and their kids' names are this. But I I also wonder sometimes whether these relationships, like there's a difference between knowing stuff about people and maybe being able to share some things and having an inner circle uh, or these seat holders, right? There, there's a there's a qualitative difference. Could you talk maybe about what that what that is and if that n- notion of pseudo intimacy yeah, applies at all? Yeah, I guess I would tend all? to say some of the things that we're going to get to know about our inner circle people maybe are again kind of at that. There's a different level of intimacy, and so I can know a lot of facts about you. Um, I can know facts about your your background. I can know facts about the kind of career you have, or maybe even dreams that you have associated with that career. I can know things that are taking place in your family. Um, Maybe again, like events, like we've got a a kid ready to head off to college in the fall. So our friends could know that about us. Um, But knowing that about us and what's happening as the events in our life versus that deeper 
um, impact that that's having and shaping maybe kind of like our being (laughs) and how we're feeling about those things and the meaning that all of those things are having in our lives is going to be something that we are more likely to share in these more intimate contexts that we're talking about. And so, um, you know, my inner circle people, for example, like people that I interact with, again, kind of like on a more casual basis might know that my son is heading off to college. My inner circle people are going to know the journey, like what brought us to that point and what meaning does that have in our family and what's the significance um, for each member of the family related to that that event occurring. And so they're going to have that more emotional connection to the reality that we're experiencing, um, the, the like really celebratory nature of some of it, the challenges we face to get here, all of those types of things are the things that my inner circle people are going to know. So would would vulnerability maybe be one characteristic then of sort of this, the quality of the relationship? If you're not, if it doesn't feel vulnerable or have a hint of uh, <laughs> scariness to it, is that maybe a, an indication that we're, that we're in the acquaintance realm and not in the yeah, inner circle realm? Yeah, I mean, I guess realm? I would tend to say when I'm thinking through or have thought through my own inner circle over the years, there's kind of a... Um, who will I build that type of connection with and why? And so um, that there has to be a certain level of safety available. um, And by that, I mean emotional safety available in the relational connection in order for me to risk that vulnerability you're talking about. And so I'm not going to open up maybe and share that level of meaning with, you know, the cashier at Target, for example. Um, (laughs) That would be kind of like, probably out of place for both of us. Um, And so the, the, like these things that we're going to want to be paying attention to in terms of, um, yes, vulnerability is absolutely necessary. And then also the where and the why, um, I think are important things for all of us to be reflecting on as well. Makes sense. And I, uh, I think that's a particularly big challenge for a lot of guys um, where we're, you know, we're not taught and especially in certain cultures like, uh, you know, I don't know, firefighting, law enforcement, military um, to, to kind of have that uh, to even feel those things is somehow, um, I don't know, shameful or weak. And so then to express that, um, I think is particularly challenging. So that vulnerability piece just kind of stood out to me. And I was, yeah. thank you for, for unpacking that. Um, so I wanted to um, continue the discussion, but switch gears just a little bit. And so we've kind of defined what an inner circle is and kind of some of the qualitative aspects of that and why it's important. Could you talk a little bit about some of the, the principles or the characteristics of who should be in our inner circle? Who should our seat holders be? And then maybe talk a little bit about um, I'm sure there's not a hard and fast number, but can we have can we have 20 people in our inner circle? Is that yeah, a, is mean, that I a guess, good idea? Again, kind of, I'll just lean in on what are some of the principles and the things that I've applied creating my own inner circle experience and looking at. Um, I don't think it's possible for most of us to maintain that level of intimacy across, let's say, 20 relationships. Um, and so the places that I'm going to go, like if I'm facing a challenge in something in my life where it's just kind of rocking my emotional world a little bit, um, what would I need in order to include a person in that space? And so um, I think of Sue Johnson's work and um, some of the security building kinds of things that she attends to when she's working with couples um, and her principal uh, ARE, accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement um, and just the implications of making sure that we have that present, I guess, in these relationships in a way that allows us to maybe kind of have trust in our system that if I'm going to reach out to you, you're going to be accessible, responsive, and engaged with me um, if I show up with the vulnerable parts of myself. Um, And that, you know, of course, the way that gets negotiated in each individual relationship is going to look a little bit different in terms of like 
frequency? What does that mean exactly to be accessible? Does that mean that I have you on speed dial and you're expected to pick up any minute I have something <laughs> that I would like from you? Of, you know, of course not. Um, but just kind of having those reliable patterns um, where we both have that trust in our investment in the relationship, knowing that we're going to show up for each other to the best of our ability and and show up in this way that's kind of about the that engagement and um, and being a support, um, maybe also kind of showing up with a willingness to learn what does it mean for me to be a support to you. Um, and so another yeah. question that I oftentimes um, find myself asking people when I'm sitting in my office is, is the help helpful? Um, because I could make an assumption that what I'm offering is helpful, um, but I really can't know unless I am checking in to find out how that's landing in a person's system, um, whether it's feeling relevant to the thing that they're struggling with or needing most. Um, and so it's that kind of attunement and responsiveness that we're trying to build in these types of connections. Do you see or do your clients describe a lot of help that is unhelpful? And if they do, what 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 are um, some of the either stories or like characteristics that make help <laughs> unhelpful? Of help. <laughs> um, and so I think, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, like they're all, all of us, right? We're well-meaning people um, uh, for the most part, I guess I should say. And so you know, if we're moving through the world and again, maybe like I'm sitting on the sideline of a baseball game and I'm chatting with somebody sharing something about, um, I'll just kind of keep using the example of our son heading off to college and I'm describing, you know, some um, of the challenges that maybe we anticipate facing along with him. And that person has a well-meaning response, right? Of like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure, you know, he'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, and they're, you know, kids are just, they're fine. You know, you just got to let go. Right. Um, but the reality is they really don't know me well enough to know what they're saying. <laughs> um, is that, you know, my truth mm. or is the truth something different in the context of what it looks like to support our child um, with their specific needs as they're transitioning to college? And so some of those kind of um, simple statements of support might be. Um, feel a little one size fits all, right? And um, we hear a lot about this also, let's say uh, in grief, right? Where someone passes away and we all have examples where someone has been hurt by something kind of like, we'll just use the word uh, maybe foolish <laughs> that someone else has said um, out of a well-meaning place. Um, but that just really did not um, land well um, for the person who's grieving. Like, like, I'm sure they're in a better place or th just these things that people throw out that maybe have some meaning behind them, but sometimes they're just sort of yeah, automatic cliche. responses. Um, and so, um, so having okay. that type of awareness that we need to really know that the help that we're offering is helpful. And then still, even then being um, seated in a place where we're cross-referencing that with the people that we even have built these intimate relationships with. Um, because just because I know the types of patterns that tend to feel supportive to you doesn't mean I'm going to hit the nail on the head every time. So I still need to be checking in. <laughs> sure. So there's sort of this dance, even if you think you know the moves in a relationship, you got to be open to learning a new style or adapting uh, the dance right, to right. the I particular think it's kind situation. Of coming in with, um, you know, that position of curiosity versus assuming. Um, it's really not fair for me to assume that what I'm doing is working for you. I need to be um, just continuing in the engagement to um, figure out with you, is this, is this helping? And do you, do you coach people to, to literally say those words or words like that? Like, um, you know, so-and-so, um, so I've, I've, we've been talking about this for a while. Is this helpful to you or, you know, do, how do you, how do you um, guide people in yeah, having those I mean, kind I of conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times it's huge just to, one, start with listening. <laughs> um, sometimes we're a little too quick to jump in and offer our two cents or get into advice giving modes versus the power just of being present. 
and listening and caring for another person showing up kind of just in that emotional space um, can't be underrated. <laughs> um, it's a pretty significant deal. Um, and uh, and then maybe if I'm going to take it to the ne that next level saying like, so, you know, asking permission, do you want my two cents on this? Do you, is there something specific I can offer you in terms of my ideas? Or, um, or did you just need me to kind of be a supportive listener? Maybe you need a hug, you know? Um, and so kind of checking all of that out in a more proactive way on the front side of the, the interaction. And if people do give you permission, uh, I'm going to assume, because I've seen this a few times, that doesn't mean that they're inviting you to <laughs> unload like a war and peace level um, conversation or lecture on what's going it, it, You We should still uh, maybe give a little bit and check in again, give a little bit and check in again. Would that yeah, be a I mean, in fair kind statement? Of a roundabout way, I guess this maybe brings me into some thoughts about the nervous system. Um, and so if I were to think of... Okay. Uh, if I'm in a ventral state, um, that is the kind of cool, calm, collected, connected type of a state, the likelihood that I'm going to be reading your system and picking up on some of the social engagement cues of uh, looks on your face, your body, energy, different things like that, um, in order to know, like, am I staying connected to you? Is this feeling relevant? Um, I'm more likely to be picking up on some of those things versus, you know, if I've launched into a monologue <laughs> um, and I may be no longer really <laughs> um, maybe even energetically or um, my nervous system isn't in a place where I'm really fully present with you anymore. Um, now what's going on for me? Um, has this become about something going on in my own system or am I still relating to you and your needs um and so um so i think all of those pieces are going to factor in um but we really want to be continuing throughout um a time where somebody is trusting us with something vulnerable we want to be checking in and um and certainly uh, being maybe pretty direct in how we're doing that Makes sense. And in a way that is helpful to the recipient um, that doesn't, isn't meeting some of our uh, needs, right? Necessarily, it should be about offering help to the other person. I'm reminded a little bit, and this is not a, a anti-religion statement at all, but just how um, certain people that come from some of those faith traditions will tend to make everything about that particular faith tradition, whether or not the recipient uh, is a believer in that as well. And that, I think to me, that jumps out as an example of that might be helpful for you to be able to sort of proclaim your uh, religion, but that isn't necessarily helpful to the the person receiving that if they're not coming from that same shared understanding. Yeah, Would and I think a, maybe that even example? pulls us back into the inner circle concept a little bit of like, if I've built these relationships where people know me and they know the types of things that are going to tend to land in a place of feeling supported in my system, um, they're not going to bring in things like that, that they know aren't a match with kind of like my operating system, how I choose to frame the world, maybe what my values are, those types of things. And so, um, so we're going to see more of that happen, right? If we haven't built that level of connectedness and knowing, um, uh, versus when we're, maybe we've done this work of building, um, that level of knowing into our seat holder connections, um, not to say that it can't happen still in the relationship with our seat holders. It's just probably less likely to happen um, in a way that's maybe that misattuned. Sure. There's a time and place for everything. And uh, in the case of someone needing support, that's not probably the time to to introduce those kind of things. And you talked about this a little at the beginning, but that very much goes back to last episode when we were talking about co-activation, as in getting someone potentially contributing to them getting riled up versus co-regulation where I'm contributing to them getting calm. And if I'm, um, if I'm kicking out co-regulating energy, then um, that should be fairly obvious if I'm in touch with my nervous system and kind of know what's going on in that 
that yeah, realm. I mean, is I that think in many fair? Ways that's a part of like when we're asking, is the help helpful? Um, and so if, uh, let's say, for example, sure. I'm chatting with a friend who is, you know, struggling with something in her parenting and um, she is talking about something where she just like, oh, I just can't find like the calm that I want to be in. And so we're sorting out whatever the, the area of concern is. Um, and then as we're trying on ideas together, if that's a part of what she finds helpful, I'm checking, right? Like, so is this landing well? Is that feeling different? Um, and I'm probably also picking up on like, ooh, her energy is starting to kind of come down. <laughs> Maybe like the, um, the cadence of her speech is slowing down a little bit. Um, just her energy is starting to feel calmer. And so I can feel that that shift is taking place, not just because of what she's telling me, but also because of the quality of the experience happening between two of us, the two of us where we're both feeling like, oh, good. This is good that you're feeling better about this and you're feeling maybe kind of like confident and resourced and ready to re-engage that situation, trusting that um, you're in a good place with it. Yeah, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of folks. And I was just thinking too, as you were talking, that I can imagine that me as someone who's maybe trying to give support to someone in a particular situation, um, maybe have to watch my own reaction and nervous system. Because if if I'm saying, hey, does that land for you? And you say no, <laughs> um, I have to not react and assume like I'm deficient or I'm doing something wrong. It could be, hey, I need to switch gears or, hey, maybe I'm not the person. Maybe I don't have the experience. Maybe I don't have the mindset. Maybe I'm just, you know, I'm wired in a certain way. Maybe it's someone else in the inner circle that needs to be providing that support to someone. Yeah, Would you I mean, I agree think there's, with that? Um... I don't know, I guess, again, kind of in that, that depth of knowing that takes place when we maybe invest in building these types of relationships, I'm going to have a pretty good sense myself of like who in my inner circle would I tend to feel supported by related to this concern that's coming up in my life. Um, maybe there's people that even though they're in my inner circle, I'm like, eh, I don't know if they're going to be the most supportive person around this particular topic. Um, and so I know they would mean well, but will they be able to kind of vibe with me well enough, so to speak, um, or maybe have some like different ideas or strategies or just like their energy in general. There's something um, qualitatively about the energy they bring to our interaction that feels just kind of resourcing to me. Um, I want to be aware of who I'm choosing and why when I go for support. Um, and then to your point of if I'm on the receiving end of that information of like, no, that's not really feeling helpful, um, then I, I guess I would tend to view this as just like, how can we remain humble? And like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, can you help me know a little bit more of what you're looking for or what is it that I could be offering you? And then we're both just getting kind of re a realistic sense of, what that is and do I have it to give? Um, because it might be that I jumped into an advice giving mode and they're just like, they're just needing to be listened to. It's that simple. Um, it might be mm -hmm. that um, they want a hug or they want me to toss out like, you know, I think what I'm actually needing is to set this topic aside for a while and just go relax and have some fun. I've been thinking about this too much. And so it could be that even as we're talking together, I'm asking the question, is this helpful? They're becoming more aware of their own need in that context, which would, um, I guess I would tend to assume, suggest a certain amount of that co-regulating energy is already present between the two of us. That's helping them feel safe enough to be introspective and reflective on like, what else am I actually needing? Um, because that's also the trouble sometimes is that we're not always even aware of what am I needing? What am I looking for? Um, and so, and if, of course, if we don't know what we're looking for, um, we're going to be hard pressed to get that from another person. Um, because the people in our lives, while they mean well, are not mind readers. Um, and so, they can offer their best to us, but we have to kind of help the process along kind of in that back and forth exchange. So 
when we were having our sort of um, pre-production meeting, um, we talked about sort of the three principles to look for in that um, inner circle. One being these, um, we want relationships that are reciprocal in nature. You talked about that. We want relationships that are um, nervous system informed so we can have more of that good co-regulating um, energy. And then we talked about um, we want people who are skilled in in certain ways to be able to sort of fill that role the same way that, or maybe not the same way, but in a similar way that I might post a, a job for a particular role and, hey, I'm going to look for a set of criteria. You know, if it's a cashier, I want someone who's friendly and efficient and, you know, maybe can uh, type fast, you know, can do things like that. Um, and for this kind of job, if you will, quote unquote, um, what kind of skills are we looking for for people in our um, inner I would circle? say, you know, certainly these things we've been talking about related to the nervous system of my ability to uh, regulate my own nervous system, um, to show up and to be responsive to the energy showing up in your nervous system without immediately reacting to them. Um and then going beyond that, I think there's different patterns of communication that we could learn. Um, certainly, if I were to use just one simple example, uh, the Gottmans do a lot of work looking at different um, specific patterns of communication that can create harm in relationships. And so they refer to um, a specific set as the four horsemen. Um, namely, they would say that criticism, contempt, defensiveness and stonewalling are going to be incredibly damaging in our relationships. Um, and so they do a lot of encouraging of uh, alternative skills. Um, so instead of leading off with complaints about what's not working for me, maybe like learning to express my um, needs or my requests kind of in the positive. So how do I communicate my feelings and my needs rather than again, kind of leading off with complaints about what people are doing wrong, so to speak. Um, and so, uh, so that's just one very simple example. Um, but there's lots of different types of material out there that can help us become skilled communicators and have tools that allow uh, maybe that increase the likelihood of us being able to get into ventral energies and stay in ventral energies when we are communicating about um, any, well, I guess really anything in life, but especially if we're talking about some of these more vulnerable um, things in our life, um, being able to maintain that felt sense of safety at the same time that we're talking about difficult things um, can be enhanced through some of these skills that we're that I'm referencing. And that's a pretty meaty subject. I know whole books have been written on that. Um, you did say I think you were going to do a pod or a uh, blog post on yeah. this um, at bigcalm.com uh, yeah, yeah. to we unpack that like a little bit more. more. Specific resources available to listeners so that if you're in a stage in your uh, kind of growth journey where maybe you've been able to do some work with um, choosing an inner circle, you're working on building those relationships. Um, you're pretty dialed in with your nervous system already, and you're just looking to how do I keep enhancing some skills to support all of this. Um, that uh, in the blog, I hope to include some specific book references um, that people can kind of take that next dive into. So you've painted a vision of what this inner circle is, why it's important, um, the type of people and qualifications, if you will, that we should be looking for as we sort of sort this out and identify these folks. Um, more practically speaking, if people are in a situation where they're looking to kind of take that next step or two um, to get closer to that ideal? What do you recommend for, um, a, you know, I guess I steps? would tend to say maybe as a step one, just doing some reflection work. Um, where am I at in relation to my inner circle? Do I have an inner circle? If I don't, maybe um, what are, uh, what am I noticing about the people in my life and who might I want to start thinking of in those terms? Um, and then also taking a look at ourselves. Are we ready to be an inner circle person? And so am I ready to be accessible, responsive, and engaged in a relationship in order to build that kind of security that we were talking about um, to support vulnerability, to support connecting in that deeper way with someone um, that we have to be 
prepared to show up <laughs> for the people that we're also hoping will kind of reciprocate and show up for us. Um, so I would say starting to just do some mindful reflection around that. Um, if we haven't already um, built things at that level. Um, and then a second step I would say would be um, coming back into where am I at in relation to my own nervous system? Am I finding myself able to show up and to stay in a place where I can contribute to a co-regulating environment? Um, or are there additional steps that you know maybe I need to take um, to keep building that in myself first? Um, and so uh, certainly doing some just good old fashioned Googling on the topic of the nervous system is something people could um, take a jump into. Um, uh, our compass course is a great place to kind of build a foundational understanding of some of these things that contribute to nervous system awareness and all that would go into building that level of intimacy and connection. Um, and then the, the blog and the skill building stuff too will also support some of that. <laughs> and so I said last question, but one, one small question, what, what words would I say? Or what would I say? Like, so um, if I'm going to someone and I'm saying, Hey, like I've identified a person and I want, you know, Michelle or whomever to be in my <laughs> inner circle, do I say, Hey, you want to be in my inner circle or what, what, how do, how does that, how does that work? How do, how would you recommend, like, what's that very first thing that people say to someone that they, if they're trying to, you know, understand this concept and maybe it apply it. In yeah. I mean, I guess I would tend to assume that if that person I'm thinking of in that way, the relationship is already built to a strong enough degree, then I may be able to have a fairly um, intimate approach to that conversation where I'm able to say, you know, Hey, this is something I'm working on in my life. And I'm, you know, kind of wanting to take this maybe like to the next level of building uh, a pretty mindful commitment to some people in my life. And I see our relationship as being one that I'd like to be able to do that with. But I wanted to know, you know, are, do you feel the same way? <laughs> um, now, if I haven't built that level of intimacy, that might be a strange starting place. <laughs> and so, so then I may right, be right. like, oh, well, this person seems like a really warm person who has, you know, when, when I am sitting on the sidelines of the baseball field and we're chatting about some things, it feels like, huh, that feels pretty warm. That feels supportive. I see the potential of building that kind of a connection with this person. Um, you know, maybe then I'm asking this person to just grab some lunch with me and I'm trying to build conversation and at that next level of connection and kind of testing the waters, so to speak. Um, I'm not going to divulge my life story over lunch. <laughs> I'm just going to start sharing a little bit more and, and get a sense of where is this other person in their life and in their journey. And um, so relationships, of course, are built gradually over time. Um, that's something I emphasize a lot with um, clients that I work with is uh, really that trust is built with consistency over time and so there's no way for us to build that trust and security and relationship with both without both of those variables present is um, has there been enough consistency and has there been enough time for me to really um, build that level of knowing well, thank you we are all out of time I um, always appreciate the conversation so um, next episode we're gonna talk about this idea of a culture of too much so lots of us have um, many many activities we have lots and lots of stuff uh, we're surrounded by material and other types of resources but what does what are the implications of that and how do we live well when we're living in a culture of uh, too much and so that's it for now thank you for joining please uh, like and subscribe I always appreciate you uh, listening in take care This podcast represents the opinions of Big Calm and our guests. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on our podcast does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Podcast content should not be taken as medical advice. All content is for informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional with any medical questions. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient or therapist-patient relationship. Privacy is of utmost importance to us. All people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality. This podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis 
sources for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast. The contents of our podcast and related show notes are all copyrighted content owned by Big Calm LLC. All podcasts and show notes that are distributed to the public for free can be redistributed via hard copy or electronic copy for free only if Big Calm LLC is included as the acknowledged author within the actual media that is redistributed. This podcast is owned by Big Calm LLC.